Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the book of Revelation. In this week's session, we're going to look at Revelation 19 verses 20 and 21. So this is the portion of the story where after Jesus returns, he kills the beast. He slays the beast and throws him alive into the lake of fire. And really, this is what most often we would refer to as Armageddon. You know, sort of when you get the, the culmination of all of the events that surround the return of Jesus. And in other sessions, we've talked about the fact that the return of Jesus doesn't simply happen in an instant. It's not just he returns from heaven, snaps his fingers, the Antichrist is killed, and it's all over. There's actually a series of um, battles that unfold. There's this great procession from the south that the scriptures speak of in numerous passages as God, as Yahweh God Almighty in the form of the Messiah marches from the south, setting his people free, setting prisoners free. And then when he gets to Jerusalem, that's really the culmination of all of these battles. And that's what we most traditionally refer to as the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, because it's, again, at the end of a series of battles. And so it was in Revelation uh, chapter 16 that we actually have the reference to the nations being gathered to the place that is called Armageddon or Armageddon, depending on sort of which translation, English translation you're using. But I wanted, because we're here now, like within the story, we're really at the Battle of Armageddon. I wanted to take just a few minutes to discuss the location of Armageddon, the meaning of the word Armageddon, some of the theological debate that happens um, sort of behind the scenes around this word, and to share with you that I actually don't believe the final battle of Armageddon takes place up there in the plains or the plain of Megiddo. Rather, I believe it takes place in and around Jerusalem. Because this is overwhelmingly, not overwhelmingly, like this is the consistent reference point, geographic reference point to the final battle across the boards without exception. Every verse in the Bible places the final battle in and around Jerusalem. But then you have this one-off statement, but what about Armageddon? That's in the plain that's up north, you know, sort of closer to um, heading up more toward Haifa. Okay, so... Let's, I'm going to go ahead and read the first two verses, and then we're going to sort of jump in and tease out this issue of Armageddon. Um, and then we're going to jump into the issue of the death of the beast or the Antichrist and how that relates to last week's discussion, um, which is where I explained that Gog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is simply another description of the Antichrist. And you go, if Gog is the Antichrist, then how do we reconcile um, some seemingly contradictory statements. But let's begin with Armageddon. And as I said, we're going to read these two verses first. So it says, The beast was seized. So again, Jesus has returned from heaven. This is just the picture. It is kind of a snapshot, as I've discussed multiple times. What we're dealing with here in Revelation 19, it's like an icon. It's just sort of a summary of everything. It's not just this drast... Um, it's, it's not in a very elaborate storytelling. It's just giving us a snapshot. So after Jesus returns, it says, The beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed signs in his presence, by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, okay, the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So we've looked at the feast of the birds of the air and the beast of the field. We've looked at the feast of God. We've looked at the return of Jesus in great detail. And here it says the beast and the false prophet at the culmination of the story are killed. And again, as I said, this, was, this is what we most often refer to as the Battle of Armageddon, when Jesus defeats the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of their hordes. Okay, It says um, they were slain with the sword that came out of the, the rider's mouth. <clears throat> now, if we jump back to Revelation 16, verses 13 through 14, and then verse 16, I'm just going to read this. We've covered this, obviously, in previous sessions, but... 
you know, the book of Revelation does reiterate different stories. And in Revelation 16, it references Armageddon. But in 19, this is really where most people say, like, that is the battle of Armageddon is Revelation 19. So it says, beginning in verse 13, chapter 16, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast. Okay, again, same characters. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. Three unclean spirits like frogs, and they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God Almighty. And they gather together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megedon. Okay, that's the um, New American Standard. Some translations will just say Armageddon. Some will say Har, which means mountain, Megedon. And so again, um, you have this location because the word, okay, the word in Hebrew, Megedon, is often associated with the Hebrew word Megiddo. It's not the exact same word, but it's similar. And then you have the, the prefix or you have the word Har beforehand. Har Megiddon. Har in Hebrew means mountain. So this, people say, well, this is the mountain of Megiddo. The problem, okay, there's actually a few problems here. Um, the problem is there is no mountain of Megiddo. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. There is a tell, which a tell is basically where you have a city that's built on top of a city that's built on top of a city, and eventually it actually builds up and becomes a little hill. And so you have sort of the hill of um, Megiddo, but it's not a mountain. It's not even, you, you really couldn't even call it a hill. It's just a city that's just sort of been built upon itself for many years. But there is no mountain of Megiddo. And there's also some problems with the words. A lot of people don't realize that, that this is a huge debate among translators, among scholars behind the scenes. We just go, yep, yeah, that's the Valley of Megiddo. That's where the great battle is going to take place. But behind the scenes, all the scholars are going, I don't think that's actually what it's saying. Okay, so Armageddon... I don't, do not believe it should be taken literally to refer to the valley or the plain of Megiddo. Again, that's sort of up in Israel, heading over more toward Haifa, um, the valley of what's called, um, I'm going to botch this, but I think it's Esraeladon or something along that line. But again, I want to reiterate, every single time the Old Testament references the location of the final battle, it's always in and around Jerusalem. We've looked numerous times at Joel chapter 3. I will gather all the nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is the same thing as the Kidron Valley, the valley that runs in between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. If you go there today, you have the tomb of Jehoshaphat in the valley of Jehoshaphat, also known as the Kidron Valley. Um, you have very similar references in Zechariah 12 through 14, where it talks about all the nations gathering against Jerusalem. Same thing with Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's on the mountains of Israel. And on and on and on throughout Daniel, they all gather against the holy city. Okay, <clears throat> so without exception, every single Old Testament reference to the final battle is Jerusalem. So you go, what do you do with this Armageddon? And again, it's it's... There is no mountain of Megiddo, and there are problems with the actual Hebrew word in, try, in terms of understanding it properly. Revelation 14, verse 20, also in the very book of Revelation, places the final battle up in some valley in Israel, up in some plain in Israel. No, it places it basically in the vicinity of Jerusalem. It says this, the wine press. The wine press was trodden, where? Outside the city. What city? Jerusalem. And blood came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Again, I don't believe that's literal. I don't believe that's even possible for, that, for there to be that much bloodshed to, you know, be this deep for 200 miles. It's just, it's symbolic. Okay, so as I said, there is no such thing as the mountain of Megiddon. Megiddon is most frequently associated with the Hebrew word Megiddo. Megiddo, to be very clear, it was an ancient city on the northern side of the Carmel Ridge or the Carmel Plains. And it's, it's an incredibly strategic pass. I want to be clear. 
If we're dealing with massive battles and, and armies in the land of Israel, yes, it's a very, very strategic pass um, between the coastal plain, okay, so the coastal plains pushing toward Haifa and what's referred to as the Valley of Esdraelon, Esdraelon. Okay, I did watch that earlier. And one of um, history's most famous battlefields is that location. There's been major conflicts there from um, Thutmose III, the third, the Egyptian pharaoh that came into the land of Egypt right up until Lord Allenby fought a massive battle there in 1917 in World War I, of which the Allenby Bridge is named after Lord Allenby. Okay, so numerous battles throughout history, including, by the way, the Battle of Barak and Deborah when they fought against Sisera. It's also the location where in the Bible, Jehu um, defeated, who did he defeat? Oh, Ahaziah, Ahaziah. Um, he actually, Jehu, I think, stuck a couple arrows in him and he died there. That's in 2 Kings 9, verse 27. So the point is, if you really dig into this issue, you start working through commentaries, there's numerous scholars who basically say this, that the word Har Megiddon, it has nothing to do with Megiddo, it actually is called, it's a reference to the mountain of Moed. Okay, the Hebrew word Moed means assembly. Oftentimes we think of the Moedim as the, the biblical holidays. It's, these are the days of assembly, the days when people assemble together. And so Moed is a reference to the assembly, thus it's the mountain of assembly, i.e. it's referring to Jerusalem, it's referring to Mount Zion. Now, biblically speaking, the Mount of Assembly could have been Mount Sinai, but as the title of my book, Sinai to Zion, highlights, the Lord's holy mountain was Sinai, but then it moves up to Zion. Okay, so Mount Zion would be considered the Mount of Assembly. You have, for example, you have this reference in Isaiah 14, talking about Satan. It says, but you said in your heart, I will ascend. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the Ha Moed, the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. This is talking about Mount Zion. Okay, Satan has always wanted the throne of David. He has always wanted Jesus's seat. He has always wanted Jesus's throne, which will forever be on Mount Zion. The Lord says, this is the mountain that I've chosen for my feet to dwell forever. So this is an interesting discussion. Again, it's really neither here nor there. I mean, it's not something to greatly argue about. There's so many people with regard to the end times. They want a timeline. They want a map. They want a chart. They want to understand every single last detail, uh, a timeline of how it's all going to unfold. And I really don't believe the Lord wants us to understand every detail. He wants us to understand the general story. And the general storyline revolves around Jerusalem. And the final battles revolve around Jerusalem, the throne of David. This is the location that Jesus is ultimately coming back to, to restore the throne of David. As it says in Luke chapter 1, when Gabriel appeared to little Mary, he says, he will be called the Son of the Most High. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, okay, over the house of Jacob and on the throne of David forever. Jesus is coming back to restore the royal Jewish monarchy, the royal Davidic throne. When we say the throne of David, that's the same thing as the Jewish monarchy. Jesus is coming back to restore that. And he will, yes, rule over the land of Israel and over the kingdom of Israel, but ultimately over the whole earth, okay? To him will be the obedience of the peoples. Okay, so now let's shift our focus to the death of the Antichrist. We've gotten to the part of the story where the beast and the false prophet and all of their armies are killed. The problem, however, apologize, I've got something in my eye. The problem is in previous a previous session, I discussed the fact that the Antichrist and Gog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are the same individual. Now, before we get here, 
in next um, the next chapter, Revelation 20, it does reference Gog and Magog again. And a lot of people are going to be going, what about that? What about that passage? We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that, but not in this session. So when once you say that Ezekiel 38 and 39, the great dictator, the great invader, Gog, of that oracle is the same as the beast of Revelation, you run into what many people see as a contradiction. So I'm actually going to go ahead and just read these two verses again, and then I'll explain the um, sort of the debate or the problem, and then we'll unpack it. So again, the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image. These two the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive. This is the key. They were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now, whenever the claim is made that the beast of Revelation is the same as Gog of Ezekiel 38 and 39, people will protest and they'll say, that's impossible. Because in Ezekiel, Gog is buried. But in Revelation, the beast is thrown alive into the lake of fire. So how can someone be thrown alive into the lake of fire, but also be buried? And then they say, see, they cannot be the same individual. Very, very common um, argument. So I'll actually go ahead and just read the verse in Ezekiel where the burial of Gog is described. It says in verse 11, uh, Ezekiel 39, verse 11, it says, On that day I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will block off those who would pass by. So they will bury Gog there with all of his hordes, and they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. Okay, so clearly Gog will be buried. Now, by the way, the location of this is, there's probably some debate, but when it says east of the sea, it's believed that it's actually east of the Dead Sea, and it's actually in the modern day land of Jordan. That's a possibility. I'm not going to get into, you know, a great um, discussion concerning the location, but the point is this, Gog and all of his hordes will be buried in this particular valley. Again, it doesn't say they'll be immediately buried there, but ultimately they will be given a burial. So on one hand, you have the beast is thrown alive into the lake of fire. On the other hand, it says that Gog is buried. So as I said, you'll have numerous people that say they cannot be the same individual. Let's look at a handful of verses that prove that the Antichrist will in fact be killed. He will not be preserved alive. He will not go into hell still alive that there are various ways to explain this, but we need to begin by showing the various scriptural passages that do prove very clearly, emphatically, repeatedly, that the Antichrist will be killed. Okay, Ultimately, he will be killed and his body, it's said, will be buried in a mass grave, which is pretty much exactly what it describes in Ezekiel 39, verse 11. So the first passage that we'll look at is Habakkuk chapter 3. This is describing Jesus after he returns, marching from the south, slaughtering his enemies. Plague goes before him. Pestilence follows in his steps. He looks, he surveys the earth. You know, they flee from his gleaming spears. And it's a beautiful passage that describes the procession of Jesus from the south up to Jerusalem. It says, you went forth or you will go forth for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed or your anointed ones. And then it says this, you will strike the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. So who is the house of evil? And this whole storyline, by the way, it goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The skull crusher is going to crush the head of Satan. Jesus is the snake crusher, the skull crusher. That theme permeates so many of the messianic prophecies throughout the scriptures. Psalm 110, he will slay kings on the day of his wrath. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath, heaping up the corpses, the bodies throughout the whole earth. Numerous references like this here. Jesus is described as striking or crushing the head of the house of evil 
to lay him open from thigh to neck. This is a reference to the Antichrist. It says, you will pierce him with your own spears, the head of his throngs. In other words, all of his hordes will be slain. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exaltation, well, actually, I should just cut those verses. So there's one reference in Habakkuk where the Antichrist and his hordes are killed. Isaiah 11. Isaiah is pretty close to the same time frame um, as Habakkuk. Isaiah 11, verse 4, it says, But with righteousness, speaking of Jesus, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. I, I just have to highlight the fact that, remember, when Jesus comes back, he comes back with righteousness to execute judgment on behalf of the poor, the meek, the lowly. And he will come to adjudicate with fairness and justice on behalf of the afflicted. He doesn't come back for the proud, the lofty, the exalted, and the great men of the earth. He comes back for the little ones like us. Let's never, ever forget that. And then it says, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Now you go, well, it doesn't say the Antichrist here. But Paul the Apostle quotes this and applies it to the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, he says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, that's the Antichrist, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. And actually, I didn't quote it here. Yeah, he calls it the lawless one. Okay, so he will slay him by the appearance of of his coming. Okay, now Isaiah 14, this is really the big one, and we need to tease this out because so many people miss this. Again, Isaiah 14, it's an amazing chapter in that it starts out by rebuking the king of Babylon, but as it's rebuking this human king of Babylon, it sort of just bleeds into becoming an oracle against the Antichrist. And then it ultimately even is an oracle against Satan himself. And it's amazing how a human puppet of Satan, they're almost treated as though they're one and the same. The Antichrist and Satan are almost treated as one and the same. But it says this, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, as the King James says, or morning star, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You who have been weak, you who have weakened the nations. So now it's, it's, is it Satan? Is it the Antichrist? It's, as I said, they kind of bleed together. You have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, the Lord says, you will be thrust down to hell. You will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Now pay attention to this language. He says, you'll be relegated to the edges of a pit in hell, in the underworld, in Sheol. It says, those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man so now, is this talking about Satan or the Antichrist? It says, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness, like a desert, like a wasteland, and he overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home? All the kings of nations. Now here it is. All the kings. So when we're dealing with royalty, especially in ancient times, he says, all the kings of nations, they lie in glory. They were buried with dignity. They were given a royal burial, most often in ancient times, in a royal sepulcher. So they would find a cave, they would carve it out, and that would become the holy family's cave or the royal family's cave, a royal sepulcher. And they would bury them in the sides of the walls. You could actually go in and this is what's called a sepulcher. All the kings of the nations lie in glory. Each in his own tomb. They each have their own royal sepulcher. It says, but you have been cast out of your tomb. Does that mean that he's not buried? No, it doesn't mean that at all. He says, you're not going to be given a royal burial. You're not going to be buried in a royal sepulcher. You've been cast out of your royal tomb like a rejected branch. And then it says, you will be clothed with the slain. 
Your clothes will be the dead bodies of those that you led, your hordes. You will be clothed with the slain who are pierced with a sword. The dead bodies of your followers, they will be your covering. They go down to the stones of the pit like a trampled corpse. So it's amazing. A lot of people read this and they go, the Antichrist will not be buried. He will not be given a burial. No, it says you've been cast out of your tomb, your royal tomb. All the kings of the earth, they have these beautiful burials. You're not going to get that. You're going to be buried with carcasses in a pit. So the Antichrist will be killed. Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth by the appearance of his coming. His body will be covered with the dead bodies, those that have been slain by the sword. And then you also have a reference, finally, in Daniel chapter 7. It says, Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the little horn was speaking. Who's the little horn? The little horn is the Antichrist. I saw this little horn. He's boasting. And he says, I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. Now, some people could argue and they'd say, well, this is actually not talking about the Antichrist. When it says the beast, it's referring to the empire. Look, guys, passages like this are very difficult. You go, is it focusing on the king or the kingdom? Both. And here it begins by talking about the little horn. And then it says he was slain, his body was destroyed and giving to the flames of hell. Okay, so we have numerous pictures here. Again, they're prophetic, they're poetic, but we have various descriptions, repeated multiple references to the fact that the Antichrist will be killed. As a man, he will go down to the pit. As a man, he will be slain by the return of Jesus ultimately. Okay, so we agree that the Antichrist will be killed. And so similarly, we acknowledge that Gog will be killed. There's no contradiction. This is just, as I said, people try to find contradictions to validate their particular um, belief that Gog has to be a different guy. We've discussed that already. But the reality is there's no contradictions here. So then the question becomes, well, if that's the case, then what does it mean to be thrown alive into the lake of fire? Look, guys, the book of Revelation is difficult. There's really probably three or four different explanations for that. It could mean that there's kind of an, uh, you know, the Lord gives the Antichrist some sort of extra life. Even after he's dead, he still experiences hell. But then after the resurrection of the wicked, then he kills him and buries him. You know, you can get really weird and technical. Or you could just say this is just a description of the Lord taking the Antichrist and throwing him into the lake of fire alive, at which point he dies, right? You throw someone into a fire, they die. And it's not like, it doesn't say that he continues to live in the lake of fire. But we do know that um, souls experience conscious torment there because it says in the book of Revelation that those who take the mark of the beast will be tormented day and night in the presence of the Lamb and his holy angels in fire and brimstone forever and ever unto the ages of ages. That's the language the book of Revelation uses. So, you know, ultimately exactly what it means, how the Antichrist is going to be killed. Will he be literally killed with a sword? Will he be killed simply by the brightness of Christ's coming? Is he going to be thrown alive into the lake of fire? We don't know the details. This is what I mean when I say the Bible often gives multiple descriptions, knowing which one is more poetic and which one is more literal. It's a challenge. It's a difficulty. But the point is this. This is probably the most significant point that people make when they try to say the Antichrist can't be Gog because one is killed and one is not. And the reality is that's simply not biblical. They both will be killed. They both are described as being buried with their hordes somewhere um, in the valley of Hamon Gog. So I'm going to wrap it up right here. Um, in next week's session, we have a kind of really interesting, different, unusual discussion. But we're going to discuss this issue of the kings of the earth gathering together against the rider on the horse. The notion that when Jesus returns from heaven... There's actually a bunch of kings and armies that are crazy, that are deceived enough that they would actually think they can beat him in a battle. And you go, what in the world are they thinking? So this is going to be a fun one. So until then, guys, I um, trust that you all have a fantastic and blessed week. Um, 
Look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, Maranatha.